The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Wrestling to the Max wishes you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Wrestling to the Max, Monday Night Raw, Review. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrestling to the Max. Uh, this is, of course, the Raw Review, and it is for December 11th, 2017. And we are brought to you by W2Mnet.com, the place where you go find all your great wrestling podcasts and a lot more. And don't forget to go give some love over to 411mania.com and last one on ProWrestling.com. Also, great supporters of ours. We appreciate them for sure. Hey, and if you want to hear these kind of shows on a regular basis, maybe you want to go ahead and hit that subscribe button over at Wrestling to the Max, wherever you get your podcast and once you do that also go rate and review that also gives us an opportunity to share all the different content we have with other people by getting those five star ratings from you guys and of course getting a little feedback as well so we appreciate you if you've done it already but if you haven't please do it now yeah there you go guys that's pretty much all the stuff to set the show up but we have to talk about this Monday Night Raw Paul lots of different things going on a continuation of many many storylines let's get into this thing man and the very nice part is it felt like a very busy three hours, uh, which is certainly helpful. So, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, excuse me. We opened the show with Samoa Joe talking about the shield. And Gary, he's just, he's not at all impressed. He's broken Seth Rollins' legs. Dean runs away from him. He's choked out Roman Reigns so many times he's lost count. Basically, He's a giant badass, is what he's saying, and uh, it's hard to fault him on that point. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he uh, also goes on to say that he doesn't need anybody to help him out uh, because you know he he's his own man, and if Roman didn't have the shield, he wouldn't be shit. He wouldn't be anything at all. Uh, and this, of course, finally provokes Roman enough to come out and start a big old brawl. However, it turns out to be a trap because here comes Cesaro and Sheamus into the ring for the beatdown. Seth and Dean uh, attempt to make the save uh, as Reigns is sort of getting choked out um, and the damage is sort of done, however, before they can get in there. So uh, all, all of that setting you up for a, a rather busy evening as far as all these guys are concerned. Yeah, and this is not a problem at all for the mm-hmm. fact that yeah. you've got to have the shield, you know, take their lumps here and there, right? You can't have them be just completely dominant over everybody. Then it gets boring. I, I, I like the idea that Samoa Joe, you know, we always used to call Seth Rollins, the architect, and, you know, Samoa Joe's kind of the brains here behind this operation because not only has he got the brawn, but the brains that are added here mm-hmm. is the fact that he played it off really cool. Like there was no, no help needed on his part, you know, the whole shield could come down. He's going to take them all on. And then the really honest truth was he knew the bar was behind him probably the whole time. I really doubt that that was an uncoordinated thing. So I, I appreciate that. They, they make Samoa Joe once again look really good here. I think that that's a, a really wise part uh, because I, I think it's something that we're going to follow along here as the story continues and we're going to need to kind of understand that you know this guy is not just a you know i I don't want to say he's not a cement block uh, just a strength he's also got a lot of intelligence and you're going to see that later on and and i appreciate uh the fact that the shield here also they get a chance to find out that they're vulnerable they're they're not as you know strong as they once were only because of the fact that they kind of got their own things going on so i i like all this it's a good start to the show and there's plenty more to talk about like you said but i think this is a solid way to get things going i think there's a lot to take away here from too because uh as you just mentioned joe gets to look very smart here very calculating and for a show that has so many big monsters on it guys who have to be protected brock lesnar Samoa Joe, Roman Reigns, Kane, Braun Strowman. You know, that's a lot of guys you have to keep both very strong and monstrous in the ring, and you got to differentiate them. And, and I think they do a very good job of that 
uh, at least here, and expanding on sort of Dro or Samoa Joe's. I, I, I mean, it's I guess it's character. Um, you know, he is smart. He is calculating. He's playing the odds. He's playing up Roman Reigns and the Shield and trying to get them to make the mistakes uh, so him and the bar can take advantage. And uh, we, we see more of that throughout the evening. Yeah, you really do. And it's, you know, it's something that I, I think at least they gave you a solid platform to, to launch into the rest of the evening, right? Uh, and I'll, one really quick thing. I love the commentary that Samoa Joe has about Roman Reigns just by himself. All those things you mentioned because of this fact, a lot of times you have these heels who no matter how smart they are, no matter how calculating they are, usually they don't try to point out the biggest guy in the group. That's you know they're about the face, right? Usually they kind of talk about the group as a whole. Usually they tear it down. But no, Samojo really honestly feels like you know he does not have any fear about Roman Reigns, and he's focused on him. Just he doesn't need to talk about Dean or Seth. It's just about, and I appreciate that. that that's kind of cool. And once again, that to me builds up Samojo. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, fast forwarding through the evening here a little bit. Uh, each of the six men sort of involved in the opening brawl each have single matches tonight. So first up is Sheamus taking on Seth Rollins, which once again we've seen a lot. However, these guys continue to put on good matches. Uh, and, and this is still worth your time. A little shorter than maybe what we're used to in the last month and a half or so at only 13 minutes. But uh, Seth Rollins and Sheamus have a nice back and forth clean match that Seth wins. Uh, with the ripcord knee after the bro kick does not find its mark. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed this very much. I did too. I think both guys really put a lot into it. They were, you know, definitely doing a good job selling the injuries. You know, Seth Rollins with a leg injury, and of course, you had Sheamus with the arm. I think it really played a factor in this match, and, and I appreciated the storytelling that they kind of put on here. And a really great display of something we've seen before plenty of times, but at the same point, uh, it, it kind of added something different to the equation that made this match not boring, not just run-of-the-mill. It, it, it was actually interesting, and I, and I kind of followed along with it pretty well. So Seth Rollins is the right guy to win, though. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as much as the bar has taken advantage of the Shield in the last month, uh, it certainly has put a, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a black eye on Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose as a tag team, if you ask me, but um, Seth certainly does need to win here, so I, I agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. uh, next up on the roll here is Roman Reigns taking on Cesaro. Uh, they don't wait for the bell, though. They just start fighting, uh, which I really enjoy. It sets a very, very different pace than what we got earlier in the evening between Seth and Sheamus, which is very much more scientific. This is just guys going out there throwing bombs for about 16 minutes or so. Cesaro, I thought, looked wonderful. Uh, Roman Reigns really brought the work in boots tonight as well. And uh, these guys just put on a heck of a match. Can't give them enough credit. Reigns counters out of the neutralizer, hits the spear for the 1-2-3. Good, good work overall. This is not the problem I think people have with Roman Reigns, is, is never the in-ring work. Because I think he's more than proven he can hold his own. I agree, and here, here, you know, this is proof enough. Like you said, I have no argument with that. I think everything you said is pretty spot on with this match. Mm -hmm. These guys are definite brawlers. They have a lot in their arsenal. You know, it's kind of funny. You would think that this would be more on the Samoa Joe Roman Reigns level, but it's not. It really does fit well with Cesaro. He is that strong man. He, he doesn't look like he's very big, but the guy, very, very powerful, has a lot to give, and they really portrayed him in a huge light in this one. That made me smile. It really, really did, because as much as we've seen Cesaro kind of just doing the thing with Sheamus and really not being a highlight, this, to me, made me feel like that they actually still do have interest in Cesaro. They feel good about him because he went toe-to-toe -to, -toe, toe to Roman Reigns and really, honestly, looked like he belonged every minute in this match. I, I, you know, I can't even argue with the fact that Reigns won clean. I, I can't. I, I, honestly, they gave so much shine to Cesaro. Mm -hmm. I, I, I smile, uh, you know, still right now uh, for the fact. I mean, usually I would not be as happy, but I, I'm glad with it and good stuff on their part on this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I guess to sort of continue on the Cesaro love cheering here, I mean, we know this dude is, you know, a great worker. We've seen it time and time again. 
And he can have a great match in any style, which I think is, is one of the biggest benefits of having Cesaro around. And as much as I'd really love to see him succeed and maybe be the Intercontinental Champion or the U.S. Champion or however this is going to go down in the future for him, I think they like him where they have him. You know, he's a guy who you could put in a tag team and keep that tag team interesting because they'll always have the good matches. And I think he finds a way, much like uh, Kane, in a sort of way to where he can just sort of make tag teams work no matter who he gets paired up with. And uh, they can have a go of it. And when it's time for him to maybe challenge one of the bigger singles guys, you know you're going to get a great performance out of him. He's going to make the other guy look uh, really, really great. And I, I don't think that's something they underappreciate for him, but I just think that's the role they're happy to have him in. I think you, you're you on to something like that. And you know what's kind of funny? You're talking about Cesaro in this way. I think that WWE has really wanted Big E to be just like that. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, I'm not trying to go to the other show and focus on that. I'm just trying to say that for the point of Cesaro has so much talent. I think WWE wants to use Big E like that. But Big E doesn't have a lot of the same offense and maybe even really honestly the experience that Cesaro does. So he doesn't. And that's why I don't think you've yet to see Big E branch off where I think eventually we're going to see Cesaro have a match or two for the United States, or excuse me, the uh, Intercontinental title, right? Yeah, because the United States is on SmackDown, I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I, I forget. Two different brands. Uh, but anyway. It's really easy it, to forget. The U.S. title's on a super boring guy. So <laughs> it, it really is. And so I'm like, you know, but anyway, a mid-card title could be in the future for Cesaro and still being a tag team. I don't think that would be an issue at all. So lots of praise for Cesaro. You're right. We could do that all night long. Uh, there's another th- thing I wanted to kind of point out here, and it's just because we're talking Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns, did you kind of get the gist at the beginning of the show? We talked about how at the opening segment it was fine. They, they actually did some things that are actually pretty decent, solid. Mm-hmm. The crowd really was not cheering for Roman Reigns. They really were not, you know, I think WB would have loved while Samoa Joe was talking for Reigns is to be chanted amongst the crowd and that to be a big deal. The only big pop really was when Reigns' music hit, and even that wasn't very, very strong. So I, I, it may have been where they were at or something like that, but it, it's kind of funny because really Reigns did not get an overwhelmingly amount of love. Even in the match himself with Cesaro, I don't think that they just blew up any time for Reigns. So. Here's the problem that uh, WWE has on their hands, right? Is that while they have certainly, uh, may, maybe more than ever, or at least since the formation of uh, the WWF, as, as we know it as this big national brand, uh, and they started raiding the territories, has really gone out and just started handpicking basically the best of the independents from the last 10, 15 years. You might even go back and say 20 for some of them. Uh, and made them into stars, and that, and that's wonderful. And certainly with the internet, there's so many more eyes on these guys that when you do what you do or did and are still doing, I guess, technically with Roman, where you're you're pushing him and you're pushing him and you don't really care how he's going to get over. You just want him to get over. And you have all these guys like Cesaro, like Samoa Joe, like Dean Ambrose, like uh, name anybody else they've really signed. And people sort of naturally gravitate towards them because guys like, uh, you know, you and me and Sean and uh, other people who, uh, you know, are on our network watch independent wrestling now. You already have so much time invested in these guys. You want to see them succeed. It doesn't really matter whether they're face or heel. And I think there's a lot of that, especially for Joe, who has been, you know, just beloved since 2000, 2001 maybe. Um, And certainly at least since 2005 after his huge ROH World Championship reign. So there's there's so much invested in a lot of these guys from some fans out there that, you you know, they're going to make a ton of noise for them. And with somebody like Roman who got what he did, I, I mean, that's sort of where the over-pushing, I think, for WWE hurt the most. Not even the fact that casual sort of turned on him. It's you have guys that people are invested in already. You just got to do something right. And, you know, CM Punk, Daniel Bryan happens, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's very, very true. And guys like Roman Reigns, like I said, they, they don't have the opportunity to really grab the fans like that because, well, you know, he was primarily NXT and really didn't do a lot there. It was really a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that wasn't on television a lot. So, you know, a different format. And, you know, we may kind of see 
things kind of transpired like that for WWE, where the indie guys are really the guys that grab the crowds and the guys that were built straight from NXT just, well, they have to try their best to get over. Mm -hmm. Uh, They start from scratch where the guys on the indies don't. So it's interesting. I just kind of thought it was kind of funny to kind of point out the crowd really never really was behind brains in this one. You did have, of course, a few, but I'm just saying it wasn't overwhelming. And, uh, possibly just the town um, mm-hmm. so who knows very true and i think i mean maybe the biggest gripe i have about wwe in this day and age is that they just don't really let things happen organically anymore for these guys it's they have a plan they're sticking to the plan uh and that certainly has been the case for roman right i mean they, they they've had long reaching plans for this guy and it's 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 worked at some points it hasn't at others and it's turned into them going through any means necessary, like using the shield again to try to get this guy to where they want him. So, mm-hmm. Whereas you oppose that with something like the New Day, which they had a plan for, it got scrapped, and then suddenly these guys take control, and they're off to the races, and you know, now they're one of the biggest success stories in the WWE, which felt very organic. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people gravitate towards them. Yeah, I think you're right on that. And, you know, WB is going to try to keep their thumb on the guys they want to do the, the best, right? And the guys that they really don't know, they'll give a little bit more freedom that they just will. Yeah. Uh, because they're thinking, hey, if you don't do anything, it's easy for us just to fire you. We're not so concerned. Uh, mm-hmm. So it, it's a different case with Roman. And I, I do hope better things for him. And I think there will be a day where maybe not everyone loves him, but I think that we'll – probably get a little bit more respect for him down the line i think we saw triple h kind of deal with this a little bit too because yes. there was that the triple h era where everyone hated triple h and he was yes. the most awful person in the world and now the same people that were hating him and completely just down in this guy now they're not so in that thought process they're more on the line of hey that's cool i'm glad to see triple h you know something you know so maybe that'll happen for roman maybe so hopefully it just won't take you know five years to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what WWE's hoping. <laughs> or semi-retired before it happens, right? So. Uh, so to end that tangent and get back on track here, we have to tell you this story so we can tell you another one. Kurt Angle's backstage. Uh, he wants the ring reinforced for Kane and Braun Strowman's number one contendership match in the main event this evening. This is when Jason Jordan shows up and decides to Uh, try and placate to his father, right? So he apologizes. He's real sorry for how he acted last week. uh, And they sort of share a laugh before Jordan brings up that he wants to be the one to face Samoa Joe tonight and sort of starts rubbing salt in the wounds that Kurt has about how Stephanie's been getting angry with him, how he's not been doing his job right, all these other things. Jordan says that he can beat Samoa Joe, and he believes that he can. He just needs the opportunity once again. Kurt, however, says that what you've been doing, which is basically holding your own against all this top talent, isn't enough. You're not winning. Uh, You haven't beaten anybody, so why should I keep giving you these matches? And Jordan decides to throw a bit of a hissy fit and gives him a pouty face before walking out. So, I... Where where do you stand on this? Because I, I really like this interaction. I like the build here. I wonder, however, if there's anybody who el- you know anybody else out there who really still cares about Jason Jordan at all in this story. I, I understand where they're trying to go, and I get that, and I can understand where you may come off interested in it. Uh, I just come off annoyed by it. I, I just do. I, I just don't find this Jason Jordan to be. All that just super entertaining. He he's a whiny baby, which is great heat. And now now getting heat with the fans is not a bad thing, even if it is a crybaby. That's right. that's not a problem. You're at least getting people talking about you. At least people are thinking about you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean I, that's kind of where I land. I'm I, I'm more annoyed by it, and I, I don't have any sympathy for the guy. Um, so when he gets beat down or anything, it's just kind of okay, cool. You know, that, no biggie on my part. So. I'm not going to say I've lost interest in him. I just don't have a lot of care. I, and I think that's very fair, right? They they um, they sort of dilly dallied around with the story. They didn't do a whole lot with it at the beginning. It already, when it first came up, didn't have a whole lot of uh, positive feedback from fans, uh, you know, both casual and hardcore. So it's, there's nothing really to stick this on. And here comes the heel turn after nobody has really cared since the start. And I don't know if this is helping him at all. And I agree with you. He's getting heat now just because, you know, 
like you said, Crybaby, uh, and and obviously I'm sure some of the booing that is carried over from him just being a face in the story is carried over too. So, I, if this comes around to it being a big plan by Jason Jordan to finally get something, I that might be the best way to salvage it. I'm just it's it's interesting, and that's really all it is, right? There's not a whole ton of invest uh, investment, I guess, is what I'm trying to to get at. The, the, yeah, you're right, and they've got to really work on the storyline if they do want to have a big match between Jason Jordan and anyone, mm-hmm. uh, even if it's Kurt Angle. You know, Kurt Angle says, look, I'm going to have to put you in your place. He, at this point, we're all happy to see Kurt, right? but I, I just don't know that the match is going to make anybody – Yay, go go crazy, right? I don't think that that's going to happen. So they've got to really find a way to make people care about Jason Jordan again, even if it's caring in a bad way, like really hating him. Uh, besides just, hey, it's an annoying guy. Could care less if he's on Raw or not. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I mean, that, that does raise a question. You know, it, we're close to WrestleMania. Jason Jordan finally turns on his dad, him and Kurt Angle on the big show. Eh, that could be interesting. Yeah, it, it could. I think a lot of people would be – I, I think, let's be honest, a lot of people would say, man, we really want Kurt to face off against A, B, C, or D, not Z. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, I think that that would be the biggest complaint of, for most people. But you know what? As Kurt Angle is going to get in the ring for a, ma- a WrestleMania match, I, 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 that just makes me happy. I don't care if it's against Jason Jordan. Yeah, right on. Uh, so we told you that story to get to Samoa Joe and Dean Ambrose, uh, which unfortunately out of the three matches that we, we've talked about here, this one is, is the worst. Uh, and it's not necessarily bad. Like the work is solid. It's just, they're very clearly working up to a point. Uh, and that is of course, Jason Jordan, uh, comes out and ends up getting involved a little bit. He rolls Dean Ambrose back into the ring after, um, a big spill to the floor, uh, Joe ends up uh, locking in a clutch. You have this big dive. Um, J- Jordan ends up distracting the referee, which costs Dean the match. Uh, and this sort of leads to a lot of bad feelings <laughs> on everybody's part. And it, this is interesting now because you have Jordan sort of just floating around, arguably what is the main event storyline going on on Raw, and... Uh, and I, I just nobody cares, you know. <laughs> they just don't, and that's the, the the biggest issue here. It's just, it's 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 very boring, right? I mean, I, I, just, I there's nothing I get out of it, really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, Joe Joe beats up Jason for getting involved because that's what Joe does, and, and you have just a whole mess of stuff happening here, and nothing. I, it doesn't really feel like a whole lot is gained other than you've injected Jordan into a story that maybe he doesn't have a whole lot of business being in, except, you know, wanting to be Intercontinental Champion, if that's the plan. Yeah, uh, you know, okay, so maybe boring, I, I don't know. Here's the thing, I, Dean Ambrose, Samoa Joe, no problem with that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think those two guys work well together, everything like that, but I, I think... The addition uh, of Jason Jordan, the, the fact that the whole entire match I knew it was going to happen, I, I think it took me out for step one. That's fair. And, and that's me. That's a guy that sat and watched a lot of wrestling. Now, a casual fan who you know has a lot more inspiration to watch it just for what's going to happen in the moment, that's, that's probably a different case different view that is not me but from my point of view i knew it was coming so immediately i said oh dean's gone he's lost they, they either that or samoa joe is going to get screwed but i really have a feeling it's probably going to be one of the shield members since the other two won right. and it ended up being the way it did and i i love the end for the fact that samoa joe gets to stand tall now that's that's the biggest positive here mm-hmm. but really jason jordan was just a fly on the wall and he got squashed like a fly and, you know, the rest of the story is just really, you know, well, you know, it's two to one, right? I mean, the bar and Samoa Joe, they lost two, but at least one stands strong. And it was the one I cared about the most. So happy for Samoa Joe. That's the biggest thing I got out of this. Right. Exactly. And 
that uh, that pretty much ties up the story for the evening. It, it's it's a good bit of business. It keeps everything moving. You get some good wrestling out of it. That's really all you can ask for. I just maybe you get the unwanted nuisance of uh, Jason Jordan hanging around you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so throughout the evening. Uh, you have Kane cutting a promo talking about uh, Braun and how he's going to be the one to go on to face Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble for the Universal title. Uh, I don't believe Braun gets a rebuttal, but he does end up scaring uh, a bunch of people as uh, Dana Brooke has now fully uh, aligned with Titus Worldwide as their statistician and research and development assistant or in charge of that or whatever. It wasn't super clear. The good brothers show up and call them nerds, funnily enough, and then that's when Braun comes in to scare everybody off, uh, which I chuckled at because, you know, Braun is a scary, scary gentleman. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I would scream like a lady, too, and run. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. you know, no shame in that game. Yeah, they, and Braun Strowman is terrifying. No, I mean, he does a little rebuttal here. Um Later on, I believe. I know he does talk for a few minutes here, uh, you know, kind of regarding the situation with Kane. Uh, but, I mean, uh, it wasn't overwhelmingly exciting. He, it's, just, it's just, you know, what he does, you know, just talks really strong and just kind of makes you know that he's in the building. Um, Kane's portion, I mean, honestly, when Kane was talking, I just hopped on my phone to look up WBShop.com for those Cyber Monday deals. <laughs> I, 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 Paul, don't ask me one thing he said. I have no idea what Kane said. I, I would care less. It, it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, that was a waste of my time. I, I don't really like either of these, though, just because it's just kind of filler. It feels like it feels like it's unimportant. Uh, even though it's supposed to be very important, they spent a lot of time in video packages and things like that for this feud, but I just, I, I, I have such a lack of care and a lack of interest in Kane. I, it it just takes the whole thing down for me. So that's just the way it is. And I, I kind of felt the same way about the, the whole Dana Brooke thing, joining Titus worldwide. It just mm-hmm. didn't do nothing for me. I'm glad for her. She's been trying for a long time now to be a part of Titus worldwide. It just doesn't mean anything now. It's just, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they've, I mean, Titus worldwide really means next to nothing. Dana Brooke hasn't been used a whole lot, so you know you don't have a reason to be invested in anything. And not like Titus Worldwide has ever really meant a whole lot, anyways. So, uh, except for the brief brush with Akira Tozawa. So. Yeah, it's it's like trying to join the Cleveland Browns fan club. It's, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh come on, guys, you got to let me in. All right, go ahead. Oh, how many have we lost? Oh, we haven't won one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, and, and sorry, sorry, Brown fans, I'm rooting for you. I really, I was the biggest. I was wearing all the brown this past Sunday, and they still had to let the Packers go. So, I'm out, guys. Sorry, they Cleveland. Tried. They sure tried. Um, Braun and Kane go to a double countout in about five minutes. Uh, it's about as entertaining as their feud has been, which is to say not a whole lot. Uh, post-match, they have a big old brawl. Uh, they end up both knocking each other down. Uh, Kane sits up, however, after they, uh, they do the spot and then Braun sits up and power slams him through a table that they pulled out. I, Kane, Braun Strowman, Brock Lesnar, triple threat at Royal Rumble for the universal title seems likely after tonight. <sighs> uh, clearly Kane is in there to take the fall if that's what they're doing here. Cause they don't want to get Braun and Brock away again and have Braun, lose again, even though I still think it would be a wonderful idea to put the championship on them. They're not doing it. They're not going to do it, Gary. So we get to sit through a very, very slow main event at Royal Rumble. (laughs) The Royal Rumble better be amazing. It better be really, really good because your main event is, is starting to stack up to be uh, no, I'm not going to say a snooze fest, but a time of just uh, brawling and some of the same things you've seen 15, 25, 100 times. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I I get it, too, for the fact that like if later down the line, if they just want to have a singles match between Braum and Brock, they can do it and it maybe mean more later down the line. That's fine if they do that. That's okay. And maybe that's also why they're adding Kane into the mix. But 
like I said before, Kane doesn't do anything for me. In fact, he kind of brings the room down. And I used to love Kane. He's still kind of do for the nostalgic reasons but I, I just think right now wrong place wrong time for him and I, I just I'm not thrilled about this Paul just not this main event I mean I'll say this they made Braum look really good here he Braum looked like he was the stronger guy it mean, meant that really he was the star in this whole thing you know, Kane got his in. He's supposed to, that, all that stuff. But in the end, it, it's all about Braun Strowman. And that's what it should be about. So I'm not going to complain about the result. But I'm like I said, just not a lot of interest in Kane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you just said. So we'll move along to uh, another more interesting aspect of the evening, which is Absolution, uh, who continue to be, I mean, they entertain me. So uh, they get some promo time. Uh, they talk about how dominant they've basically been since they got here, beating Sasha Banks last week, and tonight they will continue the streak as they face uh, Mickey James, Bailey, and Sasha Banks. Not a ton of time here, only eight minutes. Absolution, however, gets to win. And this sort of... Uh, I kind of wish they did this sooner than what they did with the Riot Squad, because the Riot Squad over on SmackDown got a six, uh, six-man or six-woman tag win very early. Basically with the same formula. The rest of the division's uncoordinated. They are all on the same page. That's how Absolution gets the win here after Paige. Uh, Basically kicks Mickey's face off. And uh, Mandy Rose gets to get the victory. There's nothing... It's not like this match is bad, right? It's it's just there. But it, it sort of feels like old hat with what's happening on SmackDown. You know, I mean... Riot Squad's already gotten this win, and they didn't really capitalize on this before. It's more about getting Paige on track, and I still very much feel like this is that where the Riot Squad sort of, as uh, as we talked about on our last W2M episode on Thursday, may be a bit more aimless in what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and you know, sure, the Riot Squad, like you said, did get ahead of the game compared to Raw, uh, Raw Ladies Absolution. Uh, still, I, I still find Absolution inter- more entertaining, more exciting, and honestly still feel like they're more dominant. Mm-hmm. And I think that they were doing multiple things to prove their point. And whereas the Riot Squad kind of had uh, one thing in play where I think Absolution had a goal of taking over everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and maybe both have the same goal, but yet I think Absolution is actually showing the vision coming to true whereas i think riot squad still like you said aimless that's a perfect word for the riot squad they should be called the aimless squad uh <laughs> Maybe but you know punk rock sounding hey, hey there you go yeah why not uh but you know what I, i'll say this I, I, as much as it didn't really matter and, and the match was okay I still think that they had their presence known. I think the way that the page kind of presents herself in the match, I mean, I think all of that added to the mix and it really did come out a lot better than I think it should have. Mm-hmm. I really feel like it wasn't anything grand, but I still felt like you walk away and you get the message. So I'm happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm even happier with what they do later on in the evening. Oscar comes out for a match. Uh, Alicia Fox music's, uh, Alicia Fox's music hits. Wow, easy enough for me to say. Uh, however, Absolution shows up. They, we get to see Fox has been beaten down in the back. And uh, Paige sort of gives Asuka some warnings. And they will let her walk away before they continue on. Because not even Asuka can stop them. Which, of course, we know is probably not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Paige uh, once uh, tells her, you know, basically... It, if you leave, get out of our way. We won't mess with you. Otherwise, we're going to make you. Asuka, of course, is not going to play that game. Attacks uh, Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville. Gets an arm bar in on Paige. Uh, the rest of Absolution tries to make the save. But here comes the rest of the Raw division, including Nia Jackson, and Alexa Bliss, uh, who have sort of been on the fringes of this, and Nia hasn't even shown her face around this until tonight and uh, clear out the ring to sort of send Absolution running away with their uh, tails between their legs and to uh, give the rest of the division a bit of a shining moment here since Absolution has absolutely annihilated them so far. 
Yeah, and you know, at least now we see that there is a force to be reckoned with against absolution. And yes, it's a lot of people for just a, a three-person group, but you know, we kind of had to see this, and we talked about Shield earlier. Remember when the Shield came out, and they were taking over everybody, and they had to kind of to, to kind of find their place, and people had to kind of gang up against them. I, I think at least the rest of this division has woken up, and that's what I appreciate the most because. It's been funny to me for a little while now. It's only been like three weeks, I think, these girls have been on. But Absolution has pretty much done what they wanted to, whoever they wanted to, and no one else has cared. But I think now the division has woken up, and now we get a chance to see more mixtures of ladies facing off against Absolution. And it's going to be even more entertaining, I think. So I think really they're setting us up for some good things, and I love the fact that Asuka still looks freaking strong. I mean – Still has that dominance, so it wasn't like Absolution said okay, and they just came down there and beat her down. And oh well, no, no, Oscar's still the number one dog in this fight. It's just the fact that now she's got some help behind her, even though she may not even need it. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and, and you know if they are going to do uh, a women's Roy- Royal Rumble, and if you got twenty spots, you got eleven filled right here with everybody on screen. So maybe, yeah, maybe a bit of a nod that direction. <laughs> yeah, very very true. Uh, so, Gary, there was a a very interesting bit of news that came out over the weekend that we will certainly talk about on our main W2M episode, but, um, Rich Swan's got himself in a bit of hot water, uh, and has found himself indefinitely suspended for, um, kidnapping and a misdemeanor charge of battery against his wife, and that has cost him his chance at the Cruiserweight Championship, although we don't get to hear it in that amount of detail, we just get to see Enzo uh, sort of motivating everybody, and Gulak reveals that uh, Swan has lost his opportunity. So a new Fatal 4-Way will go down tonight to crown the other half of the singles match that will be used to crown the new number one contender against Enzo Amore in his Cruiserweight title. And, and Gulak is sort of playing the fence here clearly he he he, you know he works for Enzo Amore but he wants to be cruiserweight champion and you have some of that at play during this as well as Nia Jax showing up and uh sort of I guess flirting with Enzo it it wasn't some of the best acting I've ever seen (laughs) (laughs) she's trying come on Paul she's trying she's trying yeah, hats off. You know, and Drew Gulak uh, uh, remains a national treasure. I should mention that. Oh, I, I agreed 100% on that. Uh, yeah, you know, it's hard. I mean, because a, you know, a lot of us have, you know, kind of crapped Oliver Enzo, and mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to try to warm back up to the guy. I'm sure she's trying to do the same thing like the rest of us. And yeah. it's kind of kind of feels bad saying good things now about Enzo. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you. This is one of the first times in a while that I've kind of been like, you know, Enzo's not so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, Enzo is doing his thing. He, he's now away from repeating the same thing over and over again. And now he's got this shtick of basically being the Don. Mm-hmm. And I like it. I like He's got his own little mafia. He's doing his thing. He's living the gimmick in a way. Uh, and, and uh, hey, I'm down. I'm actually kind of having fun with this. So. Uh, I think Nia Jax thing is kind of interesting. And then he's kind of like got a love thing going on here. It's it's it all adds into something good because Nia has something to do, Enzo has something to do, and it's got something to grabs you for that 205 live show because now I'm really interested. Are they still going to bring her over, or what are they doing? You know, that's a lot of good things I think out of this because of that reason. A lot of the intrigue there. Almost like he's a manager, Gary. Almost. Obviously, he's still Close. you know running the show on 205, but I, I I see where you're coming from, right? He's got people to hype up, he which is of course what he is terrific at, uh, and, and this little interplay with Nia is a very fresh change of place, and and maybe I can't really dog Nia's acting skills too much because let's face it, I I find it to be hard to see somebody who's attracted to Enzo, so <laughs> maybe she's having that same difficulty. Yeah. Oh man, it's true, and <laughs> yeah. So and it, it's interesting too, and we'll talk. I'll, I guess I'll throw my two cents about this whole Rich Swan stuff later in W two, and we'll do that. But uh, that's a bad deal, and uh, the the match itself we got here, boy. Yeah, Mustafa Ali takes on Cedric Alexander, Tony Nice, and Arya Davari, and the 
quote, second chance match, since this is uh, a lot of the people who have lost already uh, in the other two matches. And this is another absolutely wonderful match uh, that these guys have been putting on. They're getting time, uh, 13 minutes here uh, in this case, to really go out there and showcase themselves. And it, it, I, I don't want to jinx it, Gary, because for the last few weeks, it almost feels like going back in time and the old wrestling time machine and watching some old Nitro from the late 90s and having the Cruiserweights come on and put on these great matches. And to me, it almost makes me question why you did 205 Live in the first place without doing this first. Because bringing them from the network to Raw and sort of letting them showcase through this, uh, one, has not only helped Raw, I think, feel more uh, like a more complete three-hour show in these last few weeks because you have you know this great match with the Cruiserweights and they get time and they can go out there and I think really showcase their abilities, which is what you have them for, but... I think some of these people might be coming around and getting invested in some of these guys. And uh, we get to see Cedric Alexander win here after a lumbar check on Davari, which uh, is naturally, I believe, the right call here. So uh, we've seen them do surveys for 205 le- recently. And I don't want to say they're going to cut it, even though they might. Uh, it, there's no rumors on that. It's just my own observation. But, you know, we, we've, they're trying to save money. Obviously, 205 Live, I'm assuming, is a rather large expense. And if you're willing to commit to them on Raw, do you really need 205 Live anymore if you're going to give away the farm every week on there? Uh, you know, it's interesting you say that because I've thought this for a long while. Mm-hmm. And I think the whole reason they even gave them their own show is I think they were planning on expanding the roster so great that really they couldn't handle all the guys on Raw, and they'd be just spending money for guys to sit around and behind the stage or actually at home. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's why they thought about having their own show. I don't think they've really done a great job of, even on 205 Live, expanding that roster, showcasing other guys. They, they To an extent, they've done it, but to a small extent. Mm-hmm. And now they're really focusing around about eight guys. Uh, so if that's the way they want to go in the future, yes, Raw is the place you need it. Make it a big focus on Money Not Raw and give those stories there. Raw, trust me, I've said this a couple times, they've had filler on. They This is the perfect thing. Fill it with things that we're going to actually care about. Mm-hmm. And the Cruiserweights, if they keep having matches like this, you're going to want to care about them. You're going to want to hear about those backstories, things like that. So I, I'm with you. I, to me, in, in my personal opinion, I would have no issue if they cut 205 Live at this point. Even if they needed to bring it back later down the line when it's needed. Right. Like you said. Make these crews away so important that they have to have their own show, not they have their own show to make them important. Exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, and it's obviously, like I said, it's just sort of me spitballing here with Gary about it. But, I, I mean, it, it could very well happen as, as we've seen them cut a ton of content from the network. So uh, yeah. Cedric Alexander getting the win here is the important part. I This match is great. Uh, maybe it's if, you know, if uh, Reigns and... Uh, Cesaro hadn't gone out there and absolutely killed it. This would have been match of the night. So, uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you're you're telling me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, no, but go for it. Uh, I just quickly, I, I you know, Cedric Alexander in this match really showcased his ability. Really showed you why WB wouldn't pick him up. Mm-hmm. And boy, I mean, all four of these guys put a lot of effort into it. But if 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 Rich Swan's going to go and screw up everything, there's one guy that I could say that I could get behind, and that is Cedric Alexander, and not a bad choice. I kind of feel bad for Cedric that he kind of played second fiddle, <laughs> but I still love that he did get this opportunity. So, Yeah, me, me too. And, and uh, you know, Cedric, I'm, I'm kind of surprised they waited this long, honestly, even though he did have the injury early on in the 205 Live run. Um I just, he's someone who I think is so easy to sort of naturally gravitate to in the role they've had him with. And certainly him and Rich Swan winning all the matches uh, possible uh, on the shows as, as I think helped a lot, but I I just so naturally gravitate to Cedric. I I don't know if that's, you know, purposeful or not, but, or if that's just him, but I mean, he's crushing it. No, I, I think so, and I think if he worked on a little bit more on personality and really selling himself, mm-hmm. I, I think this guy has a long way to go. 
I really, really do. He's got the talent. I think really it's just he's got to find a way to grab the fans with his personality, some of the other things that kind of come into play when you're in a company like WWE. Yeah, you see a guy like uh, in Ring of Honor, Kenny King, and I think that he's really worked on that. He's a guy that has started to open up and become a more charismatic person where before he was just a good wrestler. They could say a few things, and after that, well, whatever. So uh, I think Saturday he needs to follow that game plan. It's it, it's looking good for him if he does. Right. Um, after this match, uh, Gulak. First of all, I should mention was amazing on commentary during that four way, uh, going so far outlandishly out of the way to avoid answering questions about possibly facing Enzo was just terrific. And, and he proved to actually be very insightful too, because I mean he knows all these moves. So <laughs> yeah, that's funny. He uh, he ends up meeting with Enzo backstage after this match. Sort of talks up himself winning the qualifier and becoming uh, a future cruiserweight champion. Enzo sort of, you know, rubs, you know, fires back and says, look, man, we aren't friends. You know, you work for me. If you work for me, um, basically, you should lose to me. And then he's about to say something about his PowerPoint presentations and sort of be a dick. But that's when Naya shows up and flirts some more. And uh, Drew, uh, Drew ends up getting spared. Us, uh, the crucif- of Enzo crucifying his, his PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, he better uh, thing my Nia Jax a lot. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I think this also, you know, leads up to some other things and, you know, possibly showing those fractures already, mm-hmm. you know, in the uh, Zo train. So, uh, you know, I think what this is going to lead to is, is possibly a big breakup of the Zo train and we're going to see Enzo and Nia take over the world. Which could be interesting. I, I don't want to downplay it yet, but I'm willing to. No, yeah, I'm just saying. I mean, if he can't do something, I just comes in, destroys Tony Nese, and then gets out, and Enzo gets the win. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you're no selling it, but I, I think it could actually be something they could use. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's the worst idea in the world. <laughs> so. Close to it, but not the worst. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so before we talk about this last bit that uh, I'm sure everybody's ready to hear us talk about, especially since uh, you were a little rough on the uh, Wilkin, Matt Hardy, Bray Wyatt segment last week, we're going to briefly, uh, and I mean briefly, Finn Balor squashing Curtis Axel. Any thoughts at all? A good for Finn Balor. That's all. Yeah, that's that's really it. This guy really could use some more of these wins. So um, let's get on that WWE. So Matt Hardy comes out. Uh, he is talking about the Great War. It's continuing on in the WWE after all the other dimensions and time it's taken uh, for him to get here. And this is really interesting to me because, one, you have Bray sort of almost complimenting Matt, saying that, you know, you're sort of my, you're sort of my polar opposite. And, and in that way, it's sort of a compliment, right? Because these are two guys who are rely on speaking and getting people behind them and amassing forces to fight, um, you know, their, their great big planned battles that they have, right? So uh, Matt, however, kind of draws it out. You know, Bray, you're a liar. I'm here to illuminate the masses. Uh, I have met Sister Abigail somewhere in time and space, and she has been consumed by evil, whereas Bray believes him to be sort of a jester uh, in his court uh, as he is the king, and only one of them will survive this great battle uh, so Matt finishes by saying he is preparing his army for battle and deletion. And uh, then we get some more of that laughing. So uh, I, I really, really enjoy it. It's just so nice to see this character back on television. And th- there's talks, Gary, that they're talking about going back to the Wyatt compound and letting these two have the match that the New Day and the Wyatts got to have, sort of, just, but just between these two guys. So... I'm all for that. Let's 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 just go nuts, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it'd be great, especially you know, with WWE's money and production value. Uh, but then again, I you know, hope it wouldn't take away some of the great stuff that we had in the uh, you know the oh, I already forget the name of it. Uh, not the you know, this is a great war. What was the name of the uh, first? Um. So you had final deletion. 
Final Deletion, yeah, you know how how great you know that was, but some of that was great because it was kind of B movie esque, right? Yes. So you kind of had that to come into play, and, and maybe this could be pretty close to it. But I, I do once again still have my fears, reservations on that stuff. Uh, you know, there's possibilities out there, and it seems like you know we have Woken Matt Hardy mm-hmm. having a lot of free reign to do what he wants. I, I'll, I'll say this though: this was overproduced. I did not like the, the, the transitions killed me. Um, it, it just took me out of it for a lot of it. I, I appreciated the verbiage. I think the verbiage that these guys used and the story they were telling actually made a lot of sense. A lot of the things you just said without all the transitions and all that, it, it felt good. It felt like it meant something. Um, but yeah, a little overproduced. I'm just, I mean, I'm ready to see other things with these guys. I, I I hope this isn't something they're just going to stick with for a month. Come on, guys. Let's actually get into a rhythm some other way. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Uh, I kind of enjoy this just because, uh, you, one, I, you need Matt to cut these promos. Matt has to get all of his verbiage out there, all of the crazy amount of quotable things that he says and, and some of the outrageous things that he says, uh, just because I think it's going to help continue to get not only the audience that is already behind him for this gimmick, but people who are unaware of it or are just getting acquainted with it, uh, getting all of this knowledge and, and just how this character works is super important. So I don't want them to rush into the match too soon. Uh, and they have time, right? Because Raw doesn't have the pay-per-view. I doubt they're going to have a one-on-one encounter at the Royal Rumble. Um, and and maybe, maybe you save it for, like, Elimination Chamber or something like that, and then have them lead up to a tag match or something uh, come WrestleMania time if you have Jeff back, but I don't want them to rush to the match because I think once you get to the match, you're going to lose a bit of the luster that sort of makes Broken Matt Hart, Woken Matt Hardy in this case work, and it's it's the promos and all the silliness leading up to that that's really what I think makes people gravitate towards the character. I, I agree with you. I really, really do, and it's really not about Rushing to the match because I'm I'm with you on that. I, I we've already kind of seen Woken Matt Hardy in the matches. Mm-hmm. Y- you're not going to get all these new brand new things in the matches. We're, we're just not. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, what will happen though is you'll get maybe a lot of more extreme facial you know things taking place with Matt Hardy and all, all this other stuff that'll kind of add to the match. Uh, but I, I just I don't need a flip flop between promos. Give them their own promos. Mm-hmm. Let us follow Matt or Woken Matt Hardy through a field and have him tell us all these things. Let him stand in front of a Egyptian statue and talk about, you know, the old days and things like that. To me, that works. I, I just – this whole thing between them flip-flocking, but I, it doesn't work for me. I just don't appreciate it as much as I would if Matt had his own uh, little promo video. Mm-hmm. I think that's completely fair to say. Uh so, I mean, with that, uh, hopefully whenever the Great War comes, Gary, we, we get to see the dilapidated boat again. That's basically yes. my end point. <laughs> oh, and what was the lake of uh, revitalization? Yeah, the, what was it? I think it's the lake of uh, resurrection. If I remember. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, it was great. I love when Abyss went down and Joseph Park popped up. <laughs> Oh, I get there's so many great things. So, people, if you're listening to this and you've never seen this, yes, go look up uh, this stuff that TNA did. It, it actually was very entertaining. A lot of people were talking about it. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I really do, Paul. I, I'm really excited. Like I told you last week, during the week, I couldn't wait to get to Monday night. Yeah. And uh, I'm here and I'm like, man, okay, I'm going to. Get excited tomorrow and like, okay, I can't wait to get the Monday night because I want to see something different. So let's just hope it's different. He don't have to be in the ring. Let's just do just Woken Matt Hardy. So there you go. My two I think that's fair. We, we definitely do need to see him in the ring at some point. So uh, We got to rate this, Gary, before we get on out of here. So what you giving it? Yeah, uh, you know, looking at this whole show, I, I think the over overarching story about you know the Shield, Samoa Joe, and the Bar was really, honestly, fairly well done. Mm-hmm. Really, not a lot of negative things to say. The only negative things really that came out of this was Jason Jordan, and he was a very minor part in it. So I am not going to judge on on that. Uh, I think there were a few weak moments, but not glaring. I think a majority of the show 
was done well. We had Finn Balor needing a win. He got it. You had that little video package thing. We just talked about Wilkin Matt Hardy and, of course, Bray Wyatt, which wasn't terrible, just not what I envisioned it to be. I'm going to go seven. I think there were good enough things here. I don't think this is an overwhelmingly great show, but I think they did enough to really have a good show. I agree with you. I think this is a good show as well. The, the Shield, Samoa Joe, Bar stuff felt like the focus – it really got to dominate a lot of the time, which I appreciated. And outside of maybe interjecting Jason Jordan into a place where he's not really wanted, uh, being really the only setback there, you get some great wrestling out of all of that tonight. Uh, plus, I, I still am enjoying the Absolution storyline, even though you don't get a ton of momentum um, as far as the storytelling goes. You have some very smart storytelling happening on this show as well between all that. The Cruiserweights get to shine again in their spotlight, which I greatly appreciate as well. I'm with you. I, the seven deities are speaking to me, Gary, and they're telling me to give this show a seven. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's delightful. It's delightful. <laughs> God, I can't wait till we actually get full-blown all this great stuff. Yes. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there you go, people. This is, of course, a Monday Night Raw review. And thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. And, and once again, W2Mnet.com is the place where you'll find all our great podcasts, plus all the other great wrestling podcasts you can handle. And, of course, other great stuff like video games, sports, and entertainment. And, and, you know, also do us a favor. Wrestling to the Max always likes to have you go subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us through, whether it be YouTube, iHeartRadio, uh, even, even if you know you use your Amazon Alexa to go find us on Spreaker.com. I don't care how you do it. Just go find us. Hit that subscribe button. Give us five stars and give us a comment because we want to see what you think about the show. We want to know what you think about anything we talked about on the show. Just do that for us. And give us some big love over to FormulaMania.com and last word on ProWrestling.com. Both great sites and lots of great wrestling articles for you to go check out and, and some really great stuff there, too. So make sure you go give them some love. And and uh, that pretty much sums us all up. So I am, of course, I'm Gary Vaughn. He is Paul Leeser, and we'll catch you guys down the road. Have a good one, guys. The previous podcast has been an original W2Mnet.com production. For more great content like this, go to W2Mnet.com for the worlds of wrestling, video games, entertainment, and sports. From our family to yours, happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. 